For the next several vids, we'll move quickly, because I'll be assigning all of them a neutral rating. Part 45 is on republics, and specifically the type of republics found in the works of the Greek philosopher Plato. Aside from thinking Plato got his ideas from the so-called Babylonian mysteries, and such things as ideologically linking the Jesuits with Plato's military ideas, there's not a whole lot of problems with claims of fact in this vid. Fairly delivers certain opinions on social and political issues, and on Plato's form of government, that I could take issue with. But since I'm here to discuss fact rather than opinion, I'll let that mostly pass. The one thing I'll point out is that it goes way overboard to refer to rhetoric in terms of propaganda or brainwashing. Biblical authors like Paul were trained in the use of rhetoric. Rhetoric was nothing but formally structured argument combined with common techniques of persuading an audience. Part 46 is on what Fairley calls science dictatorships. When it comes to claims of fact in this chapter, there aren't that many to evaluate. Fairley is going off the beam, though, by connecting these science dictatorships to the Illuminati, because as we noted previously, that group went defunct a long time ago. I also wish Fairley would use better sources than people like Michael Bajent. He's notoriously unreliable, even if he is right about some of the fact claims. Part 47 is on evolution. This isn't one of my areas of expertise, so I won't say much about it. The one fact check I want to do has to do with this claim. Technically, the Lunar Society wasn't Masonic. It was more like a social club. But if fairly means it had a lot of Masons in it, that might be true. On the other hand, it's rather paranoid to say that the group's name owed itself to the fact that the members met monthly at the time of the full moon, which suggests some kind of link to the goddess Ashira. It's much more likely they met during the full moon because it was safer to do so at that time in an age before the advent of streetlights. Part 48 is on population control. As with the prior parts, I don't have a lot to say and for much the same reason. Part 49 is on the Hegelian principle. Fairley seems to just be using it as an analogy for what he's trying to explain, and that's okay. There aren't any claims of fact I'd want to check otherwise. But anyway, all of these from 45 to 49 get a neutral rating. With part 50, we're finally back to history, and we pick up with the French Revolution. We've already noted earlier that it's rather crazy to blame the Illuminati for the French Revolution, as Fairley does. You can check a dozen histories of the French Revolution and biographies of Robespierre by serious and credentialed scholars, and not one of them thinks Adam Weishaupt or the Illuminati had anything to do with either one of them. I'll have to doubt this claim seriously, because in 1784, Robespierre didn't have any power to start a revolution. He had just barely been elected as a sort of intern for a group called the Royal Academy in Arras. Fairley is correct about the Catholic Church being the largest landowner in France at the time of the French Revolution. He's also correct about the French revolutionaries celebrating a goddess they named Reason. Did Masons help with the French Revolution, as Albert Pike said? Probably, but that's simply likely as a matter of course in their roles as citizens, not particularly in their roles as Masons. Was the Lunar Society intimately connected to the revolutionary movement in France? It depends what you mean. Maureen McNeil, in Under the Banner of Science, remarks that some members of the society were enthusiastic about it first, to the point that they were labeled Jacobins, supporters of the French Revolution. But how intimate does that mean? Fairly gives such examples as, Joseph Priestley openly pledged his wholehearted support to the revolutionary French National Assembly. Well, maybe he did, though I can't find any reliable record of it. But if that's intimate, then the word needs to be redefined in dictionaries. This claim seems unlikely on the surface since France's population was no more than about 22 million at the time. Such a drastic drop in their population would have opened France to invasion by rivals like England and Prussia, and caused massive social problems that would have destroyed the country. Robespierre may have been violent, but he certainly wasn't that stupid. Fairley also overestimates the death toll of the French Revolution by about 10 times. The count wasn't 300,000, it was more like 25,000. It's kind of odd that Fairley actually does get this closer to right later when he says that the Revolutionary Tribunal condemned between 16 and 40,000 people to the guillotine. That's the number range given by many sources, including some reliable ones. But then Fairley adds, many more were simply beaten to death by street mobs. I hope he doesn't think that accounts for the other 260,000 deaths he's missing. This quote from Robespierre is accurate, and it comes from a speech he made in 1794. 
It's also correct that early communist ideologues referred to the French Revolution. Well, now that we're done fact-checking on the French Revolution, we need to discuss a problem. Fairly lifts a lot of the stuff he has about the French Revolution straight from a certain website without credit, and it gives us a good opportunity to reiterate a point about the nature of his research. This website is not a reliable source. It's a conspiracy theory website by someone who has no academic credentials as a historian, as the site itself admits. I don't know about you, but I'm not inclined to reject the testimony of credentialed historians in favor of some nobody like Collins who still doesn't have his bachelor's degree, and writes for magazines with titles like Paranoia, especially when he's taken seven years of college just to get a two-year degree so far. We'll close with some remarks fairly lifts from Collins about the Statue of Liberty, and a statue atop the U.S. Capitol, and one atop the Texas Capitol building in Austin. He claims that all three are the same goddess of reason. Well, no, they're not. The one in Washington represents freedom, not reason. The one in Texas and the Statue of Liberty are liberty personified. And why should we think otherwise? There isn't any reason, unless you start by assuming a conspiracy. Fairly may think there's a conspiracy just because the sculptor of the Statue of Liberty, Frederick Bartholdi, was a Freemason. But that's not sufficient proof of anything, especially since, as we've seen, Fairly does a such a poor job of showing that the Freemasons are up to no good. But let's think about this a minute and assume Fairley is right. If the Freemasons were covertly placing statues of reason on top of all these buildings, what good would it do to stick it up there and then call it something else? How does that advance your agenda? It wastes time, it wastes resources, and it doesn't make anyone change their mind. One thing I find about conspiracy theories like these is that they tend to assume that the conspirators waste a lot of time and expense on peripherals that don't accomplish anything. And that's really weird. This vid gets a quarter tank. For part 51, we now go from France to America, and one revolution to another. We need not doubt, as Fairley says, that Masons in America like Ben Franklin used their contacts with other Masons to get things done. Of course they did. When you have friends and need help, you call on those friends to get help. That's whether your friends are in the Masons or in the local stamp collectors club. Socially, groups always serve that function. The question is, what does it mean that someone like Franklin asked fellow Masons for help? Fairley apparently thinks it means there was some sort of grand conspiracy. But the mere fact that a Mason met with a Mason doesn't mean there's a grander plan behind the scenes. Fairley also refers to Section 11 of the Treaty of Tripoli, which for some reason he calls the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. I'm not sure why he quotes it, but I'll refer viewers to this vid I did on that subject earlier. Fairley rightly notes that several of America's founders were not Christians. But like many critics, he picks a few of them and misses the rest. Most, in fact, were not somewhere between atheism and Christianity, as he claims. It would be fair to say that few were what we call evangelical, but Adams, Jefferson, and Franklin, whom Fairley quotes extensively, aren't the whole. There were far more founders than just those few that made it on the currency, although who could be called a founder can be open to discussion too. Other than that, this vid doesn't have many more specifics or problems. I'll give it half a tank. There are all kinds of reasons people might get paranoid, but seeing someone with their hand inserted into their shirt or top garment isn't one of them. It's true, as Fairley says, that sticking your hand in there is a Masonic sign called the sign of the Master of the Second Veil. I wouldn't doubt that some of the people Fairley depicts were Masons. But, so what? It doesn't follow from this that every Mason is part of some grand conspiracy. Any more than it means such a thing if we see a bunch of Christians all wearing a cross. Much less does it prove that they're all united in terms of ideology, such that, as Fairley claims, you have no choice of the voting office when both candidates are Masons. That said, there's a far better reason why many of these people, Fairley pictures, would put their hands inside their jacket. In an article titled Redressing Classical Statuary, the 18th Century Hand and Waistcoat Portrait by Arlene Miller, we discover that the hand and waistcoat pose was actually a frequent pose for people who stood for portraits in the 18th century. It got used so often that it became a cliché, the meaning of the pose was manly boldness tempered with modesty, and it was derived from the same pose on Greek and Roman statues. In that time, it was considered a good posture for an orator to stick your hand inside your toga while speaking. 
Obviously, the Masons weren't around in ancient Greece and Rome for that. But by the time of Napoleon and Washington, putting your hand in your waistcoat was one of the most popular poses offered by portrait painters, with any number of variations, such as standing or sitting, left hand or right hand. The pose got used so often that people made fun of it. One more point to consider in close is that this hidden hand sign among Masons is supposed to be used as part of a ceremony, not a sign you make in public. So that means even if all the people fairly depicts were Masons, they're not making a Masonic sign. It's like I said earlier, symbols have context. Sorry about this, but this one's so bad, I had to rate it empty. <laughs>